Uh, Devasis, can we start? Yes, I think it's time we should yeah, start. So over to you, Fasvila. Thank you. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. We're so happy that you've joined us today. Um, there are some familiar names in the audience, which is great. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. We've muted everybody um, just to reduce the background noise. Um, primarily, we'll be checking in with you today via the polling function. But if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to type them into the chat. We'll be reviewing that as well. Um, I would like to introduce to you a little bit about the program as well as the co-presenters uh, before launching in today's uh, CEO Strategy Masterclass. So uh, a little bit about the introduction to the program. Together, LMI Kenya and Concept Business Excellence Private Limited or CBEPL will present a series of webinars to business leaders in Kenya and throughout East Africa. Today is the first in the series and we'll focus on strategy, which will be led by Mr. Natal Zavari, who will introduce, who I will introduce along with our other co-presenters in just a minute. And we've heard from many of you on LinkedIn that you're excited to participate and I wanna keep that energy for today's masterclass. So without further ado, um, a little bit about CBEPL. CB, CBEPL is one of the largest and professionally managed business consulting firms in India. For 23 years, they have helped over 1,200 organizations improve their business performance using proven methodologies. And currently, they are helping Kenya's largest paint manufacturing company to deploy Six Sigma. Uh, Debasis? Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about Alma Kenya? Absolutely. So let me introduce LMI Kenya. So LMI Kenya is the official arm of LMI in Kenya. LMI Leadership Management International is world's largest professional development organization with presence in more than 80 plus countries since last 60 years. So LMI programs have been translated to over also 25 languages. LMI has facilitated members more than 4 million leaders globally till now. Yeah, over to Fasila. Awesome, thank you. So um, a little bit about our co-presenters today. So I'll start with Mr. Natal Safari, who is the Managing Director of CBEPL. He was featured in AS, ASQ's Global 40 Voices of Quality and a winner of the Shingo Video Contest, also named Consultant of the Year in 2021 by the CEO Story. He has acted as a judge in the world's number one quality competition in the USA. Natal also works to spread awareness on the quality and productivity um, and was personally appreciated by the Prime Minister of India. He's also featured on the cover of Quality Progress Magazine, which is circulated in over a hundred countries. He boasts a list of qualifications and certifications and among them certified management consultant, uh, certified Six Sigma Master Black Belt and Lean Consultant. He learned about strategy, marketing, and operational management from IIM Bangalore, and Natal has over 22 years of consulting experience. Uh, a little bit about Debasis. Uh, Majumdar uh, has over 30 years of rich experience and expertise in management consulting with a focus on syndicated market research. He brings a global overview of business functioning, core business process improvement, operational efficiencies, leadership development, and a strong focus, uh, customer focus to his work. In addition, DeBasis has worked closely with European, US, and Asian Pacific counterparts. He has worked across boundaries and enjoyed learning about cultural nuances for greater productivity. DeBasis is also a master black belt in Six Sigma and uh, from the Indian Statistical Institute and also part of LMI Kenya team as a certified coach and facilitator. Uh, Michael Sampson, who, uh, my name is Fasuda Sampson, so yes, there is a relation to, he's my father, uh, is an author, certified coach. Michael has over 30 years of leadership and management experience in government and corporate environments. He's the CEO of LMI Kenya, a performance improvement company specializing in leadership and organizational development. In 2021, the LMI franchise, which LMI Kenya and LMI India is part of, was ranked number one in training programs in North America by Entrepreneur Magazine. 
Michael started El Mai Kenya because of his desire to be more active in promoting leaders and the next generation of leadership in Africa. Through his company, El Mai Kenya, Michael serves a host of clients from the pharma industry to the public sector and is active in civic organizations. Okay, so Fasuila Samson is an author and certified coach specializing in personal leadership and organization development for nonprofit and small to mid-sized companies. Her mission is to develop leaders and organizations to their full potential. With more than a decade working in the nonprofit sector in Washington, DC, Pasvila strategic planning, program management, leadership and executive coaching experience makes her an organizational change agent. She believes that for any organization to be truly impactful in the 21st century requires developing leaders within all levels of the organization now. Pesvila is also part of LMI Kenya, serving as the executive vice president and also as a facilitator. Yeah. Thank you, Devasis. So why are we here today? Well, we feel that there's a great opportunity to positively impact leadership in Kenya and throughout the continent. And through our combined experience, we wanna offer solutions, practical advice and best practices to help business leaders in Kenya excel and develop their people to their full potential. Because that is after all our mission to develop leaders and organizations to their full potential. So if you feel like we do and have a commitment to developing yourself and the people in your organization, then I want you to let you know that you're in the right place. And so with that, I will hand over to Mr. Natal. Thank you, uh, Fesvila. And uh, thank you all the participants. Uh, and in, you know, we have very overwhelming response to this particular event. This is uh, the first uh, event in our series of uh, leadership development. And I'm, uh, I thank all the participants for uh, you know, spending your time uh, for us, uh, with us today, actually. So let me just uh, you know, brief you about uh, uh, the agenda that we are going to discuss today. And I'll uh, allow me to share my screen with you. So yeah. So we are going to discuss this agenda uh, today. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Uh, just uh, to confirm from the buses, is it okay, the buses? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. So we are going to discuss very briefly about because strategy is a very vast subject, and uh, I still, you know, feel myself as a. Uh, even though I have been consulting since 22 years, I still feel that, you know, we are still learning every day. We are learning new things, actually. So in this short period of time that we have, we, will, we are going to cover uh, this, uh, you know, particular topic. So seven uh, myths about uh, strategy. Uh, then uh, what is the difference of uh, operational excellence versus strategy? Uh, there is, uh, you know, five force analysis of industry by Michael Porter. Uh, much of uh, my uh, learning has come uh, from the inspiration of Michael Porter. I have uh, read his lot of books and I have also, while I was studying in I am Bangalore, I know they also used to quote a lot of examples from Michael Porter. So I'm influenced by Michael Porter. And uh, competing on cost versus competing on uniqueness, so what is the difference? And then lastly, uh, you know, uh, Fesvila and Michael is going to take us through the Pareto principle. How do you focus actually? And we have around 10 to 15 minutes time for, you know, Q and A. Okay, so this is the agenda that we are going to discuss today. Now, before we start, let uh, Devasis have one small quick poll actually, and then I'll, I'll, I'll start my presentation. So Devasis, you can launch the poll. You can see the poll, right? Yep, we've got responses coming in. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, we reached 54, 58%, yes. Let's add some more.
Okay, I think last five seconds. Okay, we'll, we'll okay. close the poll. Yes, okay. And here are the results. You see the results? Are you seeing the results? Hello? I see the results. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys see the results? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. I yeah, see a excellent. thumbs up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so okay. this is, uh, you know, thank you, Devasis. Yeah. Thank you for this. So you can stop uh, sharing these results now, actually. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. So now let's start with, uh, you know, let's uh, keep this poll result, uh, you know, uh, we'll discuss about this poll result when appropriate time, actually. So let me just uh, start with uh, the seven myths of uh, strategy first, actually. So when we talk about uh, uh, strategy, usually, actually, you know, most of the companies, they feel that they know about strategy and that's true also. You know, most of the time we are discussing about strategy a lot, actually. But there are a lot of misconceptions or a lot of myths about strategy. So let's understand these uh, seven myths that I have compiled uh, over a period of time based on our experience, okay? So the first uh, myth that we have is, you know, when you say, ask any organization, what is your strategy? Then most of the time, you know, they So there is no problem in saying that you want to be uh, the number one organization or you want to be, uh, you know, uh, you want to be the best organization. Let me share uh, some few statistics. There are organizations which also would like to base uh, their strategy on, uh, you know, on, on different uh, aspects. They may not want to be number one. So let us look at some of the statistics here. Now, if you look at here, actually, I I'm showing you uh, two companies, actually. So this is uh, uh, the first company is uh, about American Airlines, which is now considered, which has taken over the Delta Airlines recently. And of course, there is some Chinese companies also, but let's keep these examples, which were updated in 2020. So American Airlines, if you see this uh, data, actually, you know, they, they are uh, the revenue point of, uh, they are $44 billion revenue. Uh, their profit margin is uh, just 1.4 billion. Uh, their, uh, you know, asset is 60 billion. And if you see their market capitalization, that is around 15.4 million. And then if you look at the, uh, you know, number of employees, then they have 128,000 employees. Now compare that with the Southwest Airlines actually. Now Southwest, if you see in terms of revenue is uh, just, uh, you know, seventh position actually, not even second top five actually. But Southwest Airlines, you know, their revenue is $22 billion. Uh, their uh, <coughs> profit margin is uh, you know, 22.5, which is almost 11 percentage, more than 11 percentage is a good margin in airline industries. Most of the airline companies operate at uh, five to 6 percent margin. Uh, their asset is $27 billion and their uh, market cap is $28.5 billion. And the number of employees are almost half of uh, the American Airlines actually. So if you see these uh, results, you can immediately make out that even though the revenue is high, the profit margin is low and also the absolute profit is also low. Number of employees are higher uh, in uh, American Airlines. And if you see then strategically, uh, Southwest is uh, very well positioned. And now why I'm quoting uh, Southwest Airline is also because this is one of the most, uh, you know, uh, well-known case study in terms of uh, strategy. Okay, so this is one thing that I wanted to share with everybody. Okay, so sometimes it is not that you want to be number one, you want to create a unique position in the market when you want to decide your strategy. You want to decide, you want to choose the customers that you want to serve and fulfill those customers' needs and expectations. Okay, so that's about unique position that you will create. And I'll also ex uh, give you an example of how Southwest Airlines has created a unique position in the market, actually. Okay. The second thing, uh, you know, second myth about strategy is about uh, uh, that you will say, you know, most of the companies will say that we want to reduce the cost, actually. Okay, now, uh, again, there is no problem in saying that we want to reduce the cost, actually, okay. But then what is new in that, actually, because everybody can say that we want to reduce the cost, actually, okay. And even if you want to decide to become a low cost manufacturer, or you want to, your strategy is to uh, 
you know compete on cost for example that's also can be possible that you want to compete on cost and you don't want to compete on uniqueness possible but then you have to do this strategically you cannot have mindless cost cutting or mindless cost reduction programs in your company okay now again i would like to just uh, give the same example of southwest airlines here so let's let me very briefly explain you about the how the airline companies operate now most of the airline companies they have a full service uh, you know airline companies like uh, you know american airlines and those companies are a full service airline will have uh, they will serve a sort of large set of customers actually and they will have usually hub and spoke model so hub is where the major airports and then they will have connecting flights from that hub to the respective spokes where they will you know uh, take their passengers actually now because this is a hub and spoke model in that model what happens is your customers uh, will maybe sometimes are traveling for a longer duration of time so you have to provide them meals on the uh, while they are on the aircraft and you have to have uh, waiting lounges because your customers have to wait you have to provide them uh, baggage transfer facilities and all those things so you cannot get rid of those things actually and because you want uh, to retain those customers what this kind of companies do is that they also have a very good you know uh, uh, ticketing arrangement with the travel agents now compare that with the southwest airline what southwest airline is doing is they don't operate on all the airports they only operate on a particular sectors within uh, usa okay and they also uh, have uh, you know uh, and they want to become a low cost uh, you know service provider so their market segment is a price sensitive customer and convenience sensitive customer so what they are doing is they are actually not providing the meals on the planes they don't uh, uh, you know uh, even provide the seat numbers they don't assign the seat numbers to you okay uh, you know that is how they operate actually the gate turnaround time is the lowest actually their gate turnaround time is uh, one of the lowest in the industry around 15 minutes actually okay so and that's how then uh, that's how they are trying to you know reduce the cost so it's inbuilt into that strategy it's not that they are doing something you know because they have decided to serve a particular set of customers they have designed their system and processes in such a way that they you know are able to reduce the cost so they are not doing the cost reduction by hook or crook but that is also inbuilt into the strategy the entire you know framework or fit actually okay so that's uh, the other myth about strategy now uh, most of the time people feel that uh, you know the ceos and organizations we meet they feel that you know it's all about large organization we don't need strategy we are too small now uh, <clears throat> if you see actually a lot of uh, you know i i was just uh, very recently i came to know about in kenya there is this program which is going on it's called lions den actually where the new entrepreneurs or you know budding entrepreneurs they come and they you know pitch for the business actually uh, you know and uh, so there are a lot of startups lot of new companies which are coming up and they are you know taking over the very good business positions actually so strategy is not something that you have to decide when you only become large because when you are small also you can have a strat you sh- must have a good strategy actually and remember one thing all the large companies also were once upon a time a small company actually okay so strategy can also be uh, for the uh, small organization so if you take today for example a few years back there was nothing uh, you know this uh, company like uber was not there actually now today if you see uber has started and its market capitalization is sometime it's also uh, bigger than some of the largest automobile manufacturing companies and they are competing in the mobility business uh, like uh, anything they have forced even uh, the large companies like toyota to you know convert their business model so toyota now says that we are not an automobile company we are a mobility company okay so that's how the strategy is not only for large but it's also for the startups and companies okay now <clears throat> one of the worst thing that uh, any organization can do is uh, is is to copy uh, uh, competition or is to compete on the same dimension with your rival uh, so you and your rival are providing same set of customers serving the same set of customers on the same dimensions and what you are trying to do is actually just only compete on operational efficiency okay so that's operational efficiency i will come to that is necessary but not sufficient now let me give you again an example of southwest airline so continental airline you know they uh, they decided to uh, you know venture into the uh, business model of uh, southwest airline actually okay 
so they also decided because southwest if you see they don't operate on air uh, all the sectors they don't provide the meals the gate turnaround time is very less they don't assign the seat numbers and that's uh, they are the customers uh, they are that's uh, their market segment actually so continental airline and decided uh, launched a new uh, you know segment which is business segment which is called continental light now continental light what they did was they slashed the fares uh they started uh, reducing the gate and around gate and around time and they also uh, you know started uh, providing cutting on the meals and all those stuff actually but uh, they also kept on uh, you know providing that full service airline okay and what happened was the customers were totally confused actually customers were annoyed and customers started rebelling actually because they say on one sector you are providing us meal on other sector you are not providing us meal on one sector you you know uh, you you uh, assign a seat numbers on other uh, sectors you don't assign as a seat number. so the customers were totally refused and they lost even lot of customers even from the full service airline business actually and as a result of that the ceo lost uh, his uh, job actually and uh, the continental airline faced lot of you know financial losses also so copying the competition is not all not a, not at all a good idea actually okay so that's uh, something which everybody has to understand uh the next uh, is uh, myth is or misconception is that you know uh, 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 strategy means only product innovation now the innovation is uh, possible in many ways not only in product innovation you can have innovation in supply chain you can have innovation in the way you deliver your products and services to the customers okay so it's uh, apart from the product also there are a lot of other places the innovation is possible okay so consider the example of uber or consider the example of amazon the supply chain revolution or supply chain innovation and there is one small company in usa which is uh, uh, providing uh, you know it's manufacturing the compressor air air compressors and recently they have started uh, uh, something called uh, uh, sigma smart air so what they are saying is now we will not sell you the compressor but we will sell you the air we will charge you on per cubic feet meter of the air actually so the entire business model is innovated so business model is not to sell the air compressor they will provide the air compressors at the customer's place and the customers will then uh, you know they will only pay uh, for the air that they are using actually okay so their pay per use model uh, is a is a new concept actually many companies are adopting that actually even manufacturing companies so this is uh, a, a innovation so it's rather than innovating the products they have innovated on the business model actually okay now the other thing is uh, uh, you know we say we are growing so we we don't need strategy that's all again you know you can become complacent and you say you know why we should discuss about strategy now this is also one of the dangerous uh, thing actually so if you all remember i mean i don't need to uh, say this uh, more but uh, the company that invented the first uh, gsm mobile phone was nokia and the company that invented the first digital camera was kodak okay and we know what has happened to both these companies now there are many factors uh, which we can attribute uh, behind uh, you know uh, their ups and downs actually but also there is another uh, you know we can also say that you cannot become a complacent organization you cannot ignore the changing dimensions in the society in the you know marketplace actually so even if you are growing i mean then also you need a strategy in fact you need more when you are growing actually okay now the last thing is uh, it's about uh, you know most of the time people this say uh, we we want to decide what is uh, deciding what to do okay um, uh, michael porter one of the very famous quality uh, strategy guru he used to say the essence of strategy is in deciding what not to do okay so let me give you a very two very simple examples to prove this actually so first uh, is about uh, Now again, uh, uh, you know, let's say this company called I uh, I IKEA or IKEA, how do the way you pronounce it actually? So IKEA IKEA is actually is in the furnishing business. Now, if you see um, the uh, furnishing business, you know, traditionally what it uh, used to happen was, you know, you will have uh, a, 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 a furnishing showroom. You will display few. a uh, set of furnitures you know uh, sofa and beds and tables and chairs and all the stuff but then it is not sufficient because you cannot display all the products so what you will do is you will uh, explain the customers about different varieties possible different clothes 
uh, that are possible to fit on that particular furniture, different colors that are possible and different other designs which are in your bootcase. And the uh, sales uh, person has to actually explain in detail the customer about understand his needs and expectations and you know sell those things and if you are lucky you will get your piece of furniture after 20 or 15 days okay now ikea what it has done is you know it's a change the entire business model what it has decided is what not to do so ikea for example is not uh, uh, you know if you uh, if anybody is aware about this they provide the furniture they have a large furniture and their market segment is basically the young uh, people young uh, you know people who want to buy good design products but at a low cost okay and they are too busy actually so ikea is uh, for example uh, providing you furnitures and you and they will deliver the furniture in boxes okay and you will have to take this furniture at your home and you will have to assemble all the pieces together and make the furniture on your own ikea will not deliver the furniture at your home you will have to take the box like you go to any other supermarket or mall and then you will have to assemble this piece of furniture so if uh, there are customers who may not like this you know customers will say no i don't i don't want to assemble on my own but then they are not targeting those customers so ikea has decided what they do not want to do okay uh, so that's how the entire business model uh, has been designed actually there is a company in uh, usa which is called carmike this Carmack cinema and they they only have cinemas yeah, only in uh, small towns with a population of less than 200,000 people they don't operate in large towns actually okay so that's their business model so they want to compromise on those things actually so essentially uh, you know when you say strategy which means that you have to have trade-offs there is no strategy if you say I don't have any trade-off I mean you cannot satisfy all the customers in all the needs of all the customers that's not possible and if you're trying to do that that's not strategy actually okay strategy is means that you have to decide choose the segment in which you want to operate and also identify the need of the customers that you want to serve actually okay without trade-off there is no uh, strategy so ikea is uh, having a trade-off on uh, for example you know in terms of uh, not delivering the products to the customers so they are saving on the transportation costs and that somehow you know a part of that they are also passing on to the customers okay but they are spending on uh, other things they are spending on large uh, you know life size uh, displays uh, they are spending on uh, you know keeping their shops open at late hours because they know that their customer is busy and he cannot uh, come on the routine uh, you know hours so they are keeping their uh, shops open for late hours also so these are some of the things that they're providing and then you're not providing certain things very clearly actually. Okay. so that's uh, seven myths about uh, strategy okay so michael potter has said that uh, uh, strategy is about competing to be unique that's his view okay now you can also have a strategy to compete on cost okay we'll discuss that later on but uh, if you are competing to be unique even if you want to decide to compete on cost you have to be unique okay like uh, southwest airlines even though they are low cost airline company they are still profitable okay so strategy is all about a long term choices which will distinguish yourself from the competition okay it is about not short term choices but the long term choices and distinct uh, approach uh, to compete and you create a long term competitive advantage over your competitors which is not easily emitable by your competitors you know your competitors cannot easily copy those things usually okay uh, but uh, if you are trying to provide everything and if you are trying to serve all the customers and if you are trying to serve all the customers, all the needs, and that's not strategy. You have to decide what are the trade-offs that you want to have actually, okay? So with this, uh, let me take you to the next poll, okay? Mr. Debasis can launch uh, this next poll. Uh, Debasis ji.
we have some very interesting results coming in so yeah <laughs> good it's also 80 20 now <laughs> yes. right so another few seconds then we'll close yeah let's have some more responses okay i think we'll we'll close yeah, now sure. yes. you can share the results yeah yeah so here it is yeah, thank you, Dibasis, for sharing that result. Please, uh, you know, let me just uh, say a few things actually on this, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, this is uh, something uh, which, uh, you know, most of the, if you, I, I, I can understand this, but uh, uh, if you treat the work of uh, the good, uh, uh, you know, authors on strategy, uh, even Michael Porter has written, which is opposite to this poll, actually. <laughs> Michael Porter has said, that Japanese companies rarely have any strategy, okay? They are not unique in that. They are competing on being operationally effective. Most of the Japanese companies, not all, but most of the Japanese companies are competing on, on the model of operational effectiveness, which are definitely if you're in the other players are not operationally effective, you will definitely gain the share. But Japanese companies, you know, uh, usually most of the Japanese companies are competing on. So there is an article which is available. You, I mean, it is of interest to you because most of the participants have voted for Japan. So, you know, you can read this article of Michael Porter, which is explaining about why Japanese companies have rarely any strategy. Okay. And so uh, he believes that, uh, you know, USA their companies have a very good strategy. They are with unique models of business. So you can stop sharing uh, the buses actually. Then, then yeah okay done so let me go to my next point very quickly now so operational effectiveness or operational efficiency or operational excellence whatever you call it actually i mean we also do this consultancy this is necessary i mean if, even if you have good strategy i mean your company cannot survive with uh, if you are not operationally efficient or effective okay uh, so that's necessary but uh, please understand that's not enough that's not sufficient okay so to prove this point, let me take you straight to the, you know, uh, one example, actually. This is uh, uh, the survey which I have, uh, not survey, but this is a result of my analysis, actually. So I am coming from India. So in India, we have uh, two-wheeler uh, automobile companies and there are three major players. So the one company is called Hero. The other company is called Bajaj. And the third company is called TVSE, okay? Now, TVSE is known for operational excellence. TVSE is known for, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, all, all kind of operational excellence related awards. If you see Deming Prize and TPM Prize and all the prizes on operational excellence, TPM has, I mean, TVSE has got these prizes, okay. Last year, their chairman was also given individual Deming Prize, which is the highest recognition, okay. Now, if you look at the hero, then hero is number one company in India in terms of revenue, okay. And uh, this is the chart which is showing the operation profit margin of uh, all these three companies. Okay? There are other factors also important, but if you see, uh, Bajaj is on the top of operation profit margin consistently over cup, you know, many years actually. In spite of uh, having a very good operational efficiency, TVS is not uh, able to create that operation profit margin. Now, what happens when you, you know, when all the players, all the players are uh, competing on the same dimensions and they are trying to improve the operational efficiency what happens is ultimately you know nobody gains actually so ultimately what happens is once you reach your bar you come to some level your competitors also will come to that level and uh, if you don't have any kind of differentiation or any kind of uh, you know uh, uniqueness then you will lose in the market now bajaj what has, has done is if you see this uh, these are the two set of uh, advertisement which bajaj used to uh, publish so this is uh, the first is uh, uh, for example 2000 year 2000 uh, and the uh, you know bottom one is for the in 2020 okay now if you see the first advertisement what they are projecting is their market segment is uh, all the village and then urban people middle class population and everybody the bike is uh, the scooter and bike is for everybody okay and they also ha used to have this title in hindi they used to call hamara bajaj or bike for everyone now, if you see the lower one, actually, the new generation of Bajaj families, they have changed the entire strategy. They said, we don't want to make bike for everybody. We don't want to serve all the customers. We only want to serve few customers. And they are now focusing on a bike, which is distinct. Their title is now, punchline is distinctly ahead. 
and they are uh, they are making stylish bike they are making making bikes which are bikes which are liked by the young population okay and what they are doing is you know now they are uh, uh, focusing on the uh, markets which are outside of india also but the customer segment is very focused actually so now bajaj is uh, with this you know their their bike is not liked by uh, everybody so my father would not like the bajaj bike now uh, but my father used to like the bajaj bike which was given in 2000 okay so that's about uh, changing the strategy and understanding the difference of operational effectiveness okay now in any industry you know your profitability is not coming because of only operational effectiveness and uh, uh, and uh, and your strategy but there are uh, the industry itself is either attractive or is not attractive okay so michael porter has uh, given this very beautiful view about how do you decide whether this industry itself is profitable or not profitable so for example there is a industry uh, like if you are into medical uh, device manufacturing that's a high profit margin industry okay if you are in airline industry it's a very low profit margin industry predominantly okay so this is not because of the uh, because you but because of the industry itself that you are in that particular uh, your business is having that particular profit margin okay uh, now this is very important because when you want to change your strategy or upgrade your strategy you know you have to understand this aspect so on first on left side we have this bargaining power of uh, of Uh, of the suppliers okay so how uh, who is powerful you are powerful or your customer suppliers are powerful on right side we have uh, the bargaining power of the uh, buyers okay now let me just very quickly give you this uh, example of uh, in india we have this uh, uh, diamond polishing companies and uh, uh, 95% of the world's diamonds are polished in india okay but if you see the bargaining power of the suppliers uh, most of the rough diamonds are coming from only six companies so they have a lot of bargaining power and they take away all the margins so the indian uh, diamond cutting polishing business owners they don't get good margins on the other high side they also have uh, you know the buyers which are actually uh, on all the large retail gold jewelry manufacturers so they are also uh, you know uh, taking away the market uh, i mean margins actually so Uh, this company's cutting and polishing industries you know I, uh, there is a survey available i work very closely with them they only work for 2 or 5% profit margins now there is uh, the four, third dimension which is called uh, threat of new entrant how easy it is for uh, the new businesses to start your kind of business okay so if you look at the business that we are into uh, in the training and consulting and all them it's very the threat of new entry is very high anybody can say i am a consultant i am a trainer okay and lastly there is something called substitute product so how uh, your products can be substituted by something else actually okay so let me give you same example diamond industries now there are uh, you know uh, there are lab grown diamonds so now you, the diamonds are not processed uh, coming from the mines but you can also create the diamonds uh, in in the laboratory so that's a substitute product so again that's a threat to that uh, those uh, industries okay and finally we have uh, this uh, competition competition among the rivals okay so how within that industry uh, the rivals are playing actually who is uh, powerful and who is not powerful so these are the five forces which uh, you have to analyze whenever you want to design your strategy uh, and you have to then decide what unique positions that you want to create in the business okay so this is one very good uh, this thing uh, uh, very quickly one uh, more poll okay if your answer is yes you have to select okay and then we go ahead so in this poll you will see multiple choice and where if your answer is yes you have to just say yes okay you have to just click click that answer okay multiple choices may be possible
Yeah, I think, uh, okay, we'll close the polling. Yeah, I think 50% yeah. of you have responded. Yes, okay. Now people are still responding. Yeah, maybe some few seconds more. Yeah, let's close the polling. Okay. Again, we have very interesting results if you see now. Yeah. So this... Yes, yes, yes. Let, so... me share, let me share the results. Yeah. Yeah. So most of the participants feel if you see the highest is, you know, we do not allocate sufficient resources to implement our strategy. So maybe, you know, you can also understand and take some learnings from this poll actually. Okay, when you are planning to design your strategy, we have not translated our strategy into tangible actions. This is a major problem with most of the companies again, yeah. Our strategy is not bold enough. So you have to decide where you want to compete. You have to decide about what are the things that you do not want to do. When you make strategy, decide what are the things that you do not want to do. So thank you, Devasis, for again for sharing these results. Okay. 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 So now there is another view. Very quickly, I will just take five minutes more and then uh, hand over to Fasvila. Okay, and uh, there is another view in strategy which is called resource-based view. Okay, so the resource-based view is that. Uh, uh, you can also compete on uh, resources, okay? So there are resources which are tangible. There are resources which are intangible. So tangible resources in your organization are like your land and machinery and your uh, infrastructure and technology and your cash and all those things, actually, if you are a limited company, okay? These are all the things that is visible to your uh, competition also, okay? And there are intangible resources like your system and your process and your uh, culture in the company, your patterns and other know-how that you have. These are something which is not visible to your competition. Okay. So most of the time what happens is, uh, you know, people are just focusing on this visible assets or visible resources. Okay. And they are trying to strengthen. So if my competitor has purchased this machine, I will also purchase that machine. Okay. But that is anybody can do that. Anybody can copy that. What you have to do is you can also decide how can I create more and more intangible resources? Because intangible resources are not visible and very difficult by your competition to copy. So how can you create unique system, unique processes, unique culture in your organization so that it is not easily uh, you know, possible by your competition to copy? So that's also something very you know, unique. If you see there are organizations which are very people driven, and you know the very less employee turnover these organizations are focusing on this kind of you know strategy so that you have to also see this resource based view this is also very important so that ultimately you are creating a barrier for your competition to copy what you are doing actually okay so that's another view of uh, strategy now there are two dimensions you can compete on cost you can compete on uniqueness i you you can do both actually you, you you i mean you can say either i want to compete on cost i want to compete on uniqueness so you want to become a cost leader that's also possible okay like uh, uh, let me give you an example in india we have a company called uh, ultra tech cement okay this is uh, owned by birla group of companies and they are one we are very good cost leader actually okay their cement is a commodity commodity product and uh, if you want to become a cost leader what is necessary what is necessary is that you are leveraging on economy of scale. If you don't have economy of scale, it's very difficult for you to compete on cost. Actually. If you have a very small share of the business, then you cannot continue uh, that uh, cost uh, you know, advantage uh, in the business. Actually, okay? uh, the second point is that you have to take up some startup losses into the market. Okay? If you want to grab the market share, so you have to have an appetite uh, to grab capture that particular market share and to create that economy of scale, for example, okay. So uh, again, a very simple example is in India, uh, there is in uh, telephone, uh, mobile phone uh, segment, there is this company called Reliance Geo. And when they launched their new services in that segment, they slashed their data prices by one third or even less than that actually, just to capture the market share actually. Today they are, uh, you know, one of the top, uh, uh, market share they're having and they are leveraging now on economy of scale of course they have an appetite to do that actually now the third point is uh, to create an efficient organizational systems and structure for cost leadership okay so again let me give you example of the cement manufacturing company which i used to work for some time uh, this company uh, was a truly cost leader now what this company was doing i'll just give you example of the uh, system that they were having to manage the cost okay so this company, every head of 
department used to get uh, uh, the cost sheet every hour. So every hour, the head of department is getting a cost sheet. What is the cost of your department uh, in this particular, uh, you know, in the last one hour actually, okay? And then you have the target cost and then you have to discuss on the variances and all the stuff. So you should have a very good system uh, if you want to become a cost leader. And you, of course, lastly, you should have a very tight control on the cost and the overheads in your company. Okay, so all those systems have to be aligned and there has to be a fit uh, so that you can become a cost leader. Just uh, doing this and also this uh, has to be inbuilt into your strategy. What are the trade-offs that you want to do? What are the things that you do not want to do? You cannot uh, combine two things together. For example, you cannot decide that I will serve the meal also and I will also have, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, the, the less turnaround time at the gate. It's not possible. So if you want to provide meal, the gate turnaround time is going to increase. So that's uh, what you have to trade off. Okay? So you have to decide on that. Actually. Now, if you want to become a differentiator, then uh, again, you should have a very strong innovation orientation in your organization. Okay. And I have seen many companies, they say we, we and a lot of talk in innovation and a lot of discussion on innovation. But when you go to the reality, if you go to the, ask these companies, what is the budget that you spend for innovation? And they hardly have any budget specifically for innovation. Okay. So if you want to, uh, you know, become a differentiator, you have to have a strong innovation orientation in your company. Uh, also, if you want to innovate, you have to understand and accept that there'll be mistakes, there'll be failures. Okay. You cannot have, uh, no company was able to, you know, uh, launch new products. Uh, without uh, without failures actually okay so there are failures and there will be failures okay and you should have an appetite to absorb that particular failure in your organization and uh, you should also have uh, the concept to market time as minimum as possible okay because uh, that's very critical nowadays so you conceive some ideas but by the time you launch that idea somebody has already copied that or you know, captured those ideas and they will grab the market share and you will lose that uh, front mover advantage, okay? So your concept to market time has to be minimum and, and best in the class actually, okay? Uh, then you have to understand your customer's behavior and needs, okay? So you your company has to have a very good system and processes to understand this. So again, let me give very a quick example of this cement company. Uh, this Ultratech cement company used to have, they have this mobile van where, uh, you know, even if you are using, uh, not using their products, if you are using some other company cement, then also they will come to your home, they will taste the cement and they will give you the result and they will give you a free advice. Okay? So they have a mobile van, which will go to all the customers places. And this mobile van, you know, will have a, a, a technician and this technician will taste your cement, even if it is not ultra tech cement, even if it is not their cement, and they will guide you on, uh, you know, what you should do with your uh, cement actually. But what it has done is, you know, over a period of time, this company has this cement company, has captured a lot of customer data. And now they are trying to design new products, new cement, uh, new, uh, you know, new kind of uh, segments into the cement industries. Okay. So that's about understanding your behavior and uh, needs of the customers. And lastly, you have to find out the gaps in the supply chain, supply and need actually. So there is always a gap in the supply and the need, okay, in the business. How, why the startups, some of the startups are so successful, of course there is a failure, but why are they so successful? because these startups are able to find out that gap, okay? Uber was able to identify the gap in the market, okay? So there is always some space available. You have to identify these gaps actually, and they have to play on those gaps actually, okay? So you should have uh, that, uh, you know, ability to identify these gaps and work on those things. So that's all from my side, and, uh, uh, and uh, I will hand over to Pasvila. I have taken some more time than expected, but. Uh, because of some technical glitches. Uh, so over to you, Feswila. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natal. So we have a poll. Debasis, did you have ability to put the poll up? Yeah, yeah. I'll just, yeah. So how many of you are familiar with the Pareto Principle before we get started and launched? One of the things I've really enjoyed throughout this uh, masterclass today is seeing the results of the polling in real time. It's been quite interesting. Okay. 
Yeah, so yeah. sixty-eight percent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that. Uh, let me. Yeah. Close now and let me share. Yeah. So this is the results. Yeah. Do you see the results? I see them. Awesome. So we're about fifty-two percent of folks um, on today's uh, webinar are familiar, which is great, and then about forty-eight. So, um, yeah, this is wonderful. Okay. So what I'll share is going to be useful for the majority of folks. Yeah. Awesome. So now that you've heard just about why strategy is used and the benefits for developing a sound strategy, and you've also heard a lot today about deciding what not to do, um, but how does one really go about figuring out where to focus their energy and their efforts? Um, and what that means for your day-to-day -day efforts. So if you're a CEO or a decision maker in your business, how you spend your time is by far the most important factor for success. Can we all agree? Type in yes, I just wanna see. Um, and what stage you're at in your business and how you spend your time may look differently, right? So naturally, if you're um, a startup CEO, uh, what activities you spend your time doing in your business will look different and be different than if you're a CEO of an established institution. Right. So let's review for those of the of the 48 uh, percent who are not familiar. Uh, what is the Pareto principle? What is it all about? The Pareto principle uh, is actually named after economist Wilfredo Pareto, and it asserts that there's an unequal relationship between inputs and outputs. It's also known as the 80-20 rule which is a powerful concept that's been widely used uh, and embraced by business leaders. So to put it simply, uh, 80 20 rule maintains that 80% of outcomes, so that's outputs and results, come from just 20% of causes, inputs or time, right? So in the 80 20 rule, you prioritize the 20% of factors that will produce the best results. So the principle of the 80 20 rule is to identify an entity's best assets and use them efficiently to create maximum value. So let's think for a minute, how are you spending your time in your business now? And how is that contributing to your success or hindering your progress? Now let's consider your employees and how they're using their time and what results they're getting, right? So now if you think of your top performers and what sets them apart from the rest, from experience, this is my own personal, it's a few different things. For me, what I've noticed is that uh, top performers, they hold themselves accountable, they're incentivized, they're organized, and last but certainly not least is that they believe in the company and its leadership. But the 80-20 rule goes beyond just deciding how to spend your time. Uh, and I'll kick it off to Michael, who can talk a little bit more about the other areas where the 80-20 rule can apply. Do we have him on? Okay, I'll pick it up. Why not? So the 80-20 rule applies to multiple facets of the business, right? As I just mentioned, it's not just about your personal actions and, or that of your employees, but also your products and services and customers. So let's go beyond just how you spend your time and just briefly take a look at your inventory, for example, of products and services. So ask yourself, are a handful responsible for the majority of your income, right? Let's say maybe you sell a ton of product X, but you're making more on product Y because it's return on investment is 10 times that of product X. And maybe you're offering X and Y services for the same price, but it takes you four hours more to complete X and only two hours to complete Y. You can start to find the imbalance of effort, right? So then spending more time on activities that are high priority the most rewards naturally. So consider eliminating activities that don't have high payoff, right? Or aren't creating enough value for you and your business. And you can start to see sort of the snowball effect of how gaining just a slight edge in your efforts picks up in your organization, creating better results and maximizes your value overall. So at the end of the day, applying the 80-20 rule with a sound 
business strategy can dramatically increase your productivity, your profits, and your free time. And let's be honest, who doesn't want more free time, right? So now that you have your 80-20 lens on, you can start to see opportunities that really can propel your company forward and perhaps even what may be holding you back. Um, so there's an exercise, we're not gonna talk about it today, but if you guys are interested, there's uh, an exercise and a handy calculation called the Pareto analysis. If you wanna check, check that out or Google it, um, it, it allows you to determine exactly where your 80-20 breakdown would be in your business. So that's a little bit about 80-20. I know we wanted to leave just some time for Q&A and we're coming up just at the uh, one hour limit. So I will hand off um, back to DeBasis if you wanna do Q&A. because I know you've been monitoring the chat function. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, Nithal, we need to unmute uh, some of the participants. And any questions? Because we there has there was a, some mention of Michael Porter being a patriotic American, and that's why he feels strategy American companies have better strategy. Nithal, are you able to hear me? You have to unmute. Yeah, Nithal, can you unmute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, so definitely. So this uh, I will answer this. Yeah. So. Uh, of course, you know, I am, I, I, I uh, what I, uh, you know, like, uh, I, I'm, this is just as I also say the same thing that this is the view of Michael Porter. This is not my view, but actually I just was sharing that, uh, for example, Toyota, somebody has also asked a question and a lot of companies are uh, influenced by Toyota and uh, their methodology of lean management. But if you see today, Toyota is in terms of market share is not the number one company. The number one company in terms of market share is Tesla now. Okay, so uh, Tesla is number one market uh, uh, having market share because of its innovative business model actually. Okay, and Toyota in 2019, for example, also has uh, changed, and their uh, chairman, uh, Mr. Toyota, uh, uh, said that we are not an automobile company; we are now a mobility company. Okay, so Toyota itself is also now doing a lot of innovation. Okay. So, of course, I, we are not saying that only American companies have a great strategy. This was just a relative. It's not uh, absolute or something like that. And nothing to, you know, nothing in favor of any particular country or something like that, actually. So, I was just uh, trying to understand about uh, or validating kind of Michael Porter's view on strategy. Okay. So, that's what something which I was just trying to do. Okay. You can have your, I mean, there are, there are companies who are having very innovative strategies, even in India also. I have a lot of examples in India. I have recently come to know about in Kenya also, there are companies called Twiga Food. I just recently uh, raised, uh, understood their case study. This is very interesting. One of the most innovative company in Kenya, Twiga Food. Okay. So there are companies uh, in all part of the world which are innovative, not only in USA, but that was just, uh, you know, to explain you the context of operational effectiveness. Thank you. So we have... Uh, yeah, we have a question from Mustafa. Yeah. Yeah. So considering that strategy is a long-term thing, how do you test it is working and the company is moving in the right direction? I think it's a very good question. Yeah, so thank you. That's a really definitely a very good question, actually. So definitely, so first thing is uh, you have to decide is, uh, is about the markets that you want to serve, okay? the customer segments that you want to serve. One of the fundamental mistakes that most of the companies make is that uh, I know you maybe sometimes you are having a superior economic performance not only because of your strategy but because of uh, the tide you know that uh, that economy itself is growing and then you are also growing actually okay uh, so first thing that you have to do is uh, you have to decide on the customers that you want to serve okay which are the customers that you want to serve and which particular need of those customers you want to serve actually okay so you you start from that point on, onwards actually okay and uh, and about uh, you know so you have to have a very clear cut uh, you know roadmap uh, uh, for that on how do you deploy because it is not just about putting this on paper and deciding about uh, what we want to do because that's very easy to say actually okay uh, but the reality in reality what you have to do is you have to have a very uh, long term uh, you know uh, action plan so usually most of the companies they have uh, you know, nowadays, you know, three years plan and a short term plan for one year. So you have to have these action plans which you will put in place and uh, having a very rigorous and regular review mechanism of uh, of, of your, uh, you know, strategies actually. Okay. So, yeah. 
Okay. I think there was somebody wants the recorded uh, because he has missed something. So if I think if you are sending the request, we'll surely accept that request and send you see to it that you send the you get the recorded version. Okay. Uh, there is another question, which is, can you implement both the cost leadership strategy and differentiation strategy simultaneously? Uh, simultaneously, see, if you are a differentiator, this is a very good question again. But if you are a differentiator and if you are not charging a premium, you are not a differentiator. It's as simple as that. So if you are a differentiator, you must have a premium. The customer should be able to give you premium. So if, you are not, if your customers are not giving you premium, that means you don't have a uh, you know differentiation. But of course, you can decide to become a cost leader, and then you can have like uh, I gave you example of uh, I give you example of Southwest Airlines for example. So that's because uh, they have decided to compete, uh, be, uh, serve the customers who are price sensitive. They have decided to serve the customers who are uh, convenience sensitive. Okay, so that's uh, about. So they are actually I don't say they are a cost leader kind of a thing, but they are actually their strategy itself is to serve those kind of customers. So they have decided to choose. They have decided to serve only those kind of customers. Okay, so usually it is uh, you know it's not possible that you compete on both the dimensions actually. So if you are really unique, you should be definitely will be you know charging some kind of premium actually. Okay. okay, there was a comment on the Toyota versus Tesla market share because some somebody says that in Uganda, so I, that, yeah, they have not yeah, seen I, I, anything of Tesla, but I think you mentioned at a very broad level, right? No, this is not market share. This is about your market capitalization. So if you see the value of the companies now, right, right. the value of Tesla is more than value of uh, value of uh, Toyota now. Okay, So Toyota is not number one automobile company now. Tesla is number one automobile company in terms of market cap. In right. terms of sales, maybe yes, Toyota. Okay, But Toyota is also changing its business model. Right. right. Yeah. I think Shuhel has a very important question. I think... Uh, he feels he has a good strategy, but still there's a bit of a struggle in managing it. I mean, yeah. do, do we have some solutions, practical toolkits, ready-made something for tracking that strategy or suggesting to him? I think this is something we need to yeah. have more sessions or understanding on that. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we have, a, we have a service where we do the assessment of the organizations on the complete aspect of this, we have our own kind of, I would say, not toolkit, but we have designed our own methodology to assess the organizations on various aspects, okay? So maybe we can uh, we can do that on one-to-one -one basis actually with you, or maybe we can discuss with you about that actually. But uh, uh, there is nothing, uh, Some it, I mean, I can, we cannot have any ready-made answer for this, but uh, definitely once we understand, uh, we have to understand whether uh, the proper resources are deployed for the strategy that you have or not and all those stuff. So there are a lot of things that we have to understand to answer this question. But definitely uh, we have a service where we can evaluate and we can, uh, you know, guide you on how to, you know, what, where is the gap and how you can bridge on those things. Actually, Yes. I think uh, David has mentioned a lot of questions, but I think that would be something where I think it's better, David, if we can get into a separate conversation and understand your requirements, and then maybe we, we can spend some time on that. There's a good question from Grace. Any comments on strategy for non-profits? Yeah, very good question, actually. So, uh, you know, it is not that strategy is only for profit-making organizations, even not for profit companies. So I don't, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, so the not-for-profit companies also... Uh, need to have a good strategy. I have um, uh, very good examples. Uh, for example, uh, you know, in India, there is a company called Aksai Patra. I'm not that familiar with African market, but in India, we have a company, uh, not-for-profit organization called Aksai Patra. Uh, they have been also featured at a lot of places about that strategy, actually. So the way uh, they manage their entire operation, actually. So, you know, the way they integrate all the beneficiaries and also... Uh, their entire system, what they have created. So they have uh, strategically, so their not-for-profit service is to provide uh, free meals to the children in the school, okay? And uh, those who cannot afford the food actually, okay? Uh, lunch and uh, something like that. So what they are doing is they have strategically positioned their kitchens, the way they have positioned their kitchens, the way they manage uh, the entire, uh, you know, uh, the system, for delivering this uh, to all the you know uh, students actually 
So they have a very unique uh, strategy on those aspects, actually. So they have done a lot of innovations in the way they will deliver the uh, food to the, you know, uh, children, actually. So definitely, I don't have any specific, uh, you know, uh, answer that there is. But yes, definitely not-for-profit organizations also need uh, a strategy. And uh, they can have a strategy. They must have a strategy. Yes. Okay, I think uh, more or less we have covered uh, most of the questions. There are requests for the recorded. So please send us the request. We'll surely accept that and send it back to you. Uh, finally, I think Michael, uh, any last comments from your side? I think Michael, I think that would be good before we okay. close out. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Debasis. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, speak because of uh, technology, but Faswila handles it very well. I'm pleased that everyone has had a chance to ask plenty of questions. And it looks like from the responses of the chat that there are other people who want to follow up with uh, you and Nital on this. So I'm, I'm very hopeful for that. Back over to you, Debasis. Okay. Just before we uh, actually leave, I just wanna say for those of you on the webinar today, um, I hope that uh, obviously you found value in today's webinar. Again, this is a part of a series that we're doing. Um, I encourage you to connect with myself and our team on LinkedIn. Uh, follow our profiles if you haven't already. You want to get updates for the upcoming master classes and just engage with our uh, content uh, generally. Um, I also ask that at this time, if you could do us a huge favor and fill out a workshop evaluation, this allows us to really learn and develop and continue to brighten great service for you. Um, and I will send the link into the evaluation in the chat here for everyone. So if you don't mind, just before signing off, if you take just 30 seconds to complete that now, that would greatly benefit us as well. Um, yeah, and I just want to just join my colleagues in saying thank you for making the time to stick with us today. And we hope that um, you found this session valuable and we appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate your time. I appreciate. Thank you. I think last 30 seconds for the form filling. Yes, Aswila? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So anybody who wants uh, to reach out to us in, uh, uh, you know, East Africa, uh, Michael and his office is our, uh, you know, is a point where you can contact for LMI and for our services. Yeah. Awesome. Again, thank you for spending time with us today. Take care and until next time. Okay. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, take care.